Most Windows PowerShell scripting constructs require an expression that they evaluate. And so long as the expression placeholder that I'm going to show you evaluates to true or false, you're good. There's a couple ways you can get to true or false. Typically, you're going to use an expression containing a comparison operator. So uh, is 5 equal to 5? That's true. You could also, however, just put a property or a variable that contains true or false. You don't have to compare it to something to get true or false if it is already going to be true or false. So let's start by looking at two decision-making constructs, if, else, if, else, and switch. Here's the syntax for this construct. The if keyword, followed by some kind of expression which evaluates to true or false. That expression is contained within parentheses. Then, inside curly braces, is the code that will run if the expression is true. For this example, I've used the pound or hash sign to include a PowerShell comment, code A, which simply indicates where your code might go. Optionally, I can then have one or more else if keywords, each of which has their own expression and code block. Only the first expression which evaluates to true will execute. Finally, and again optionally, I can have an else block. This doesn't get an expression, and it will execute only if none of the preceding expressions have evaluated to true. You can take a few things away from this which apply to all of the constructs I'll be showing you. First, the conditional expressions are always in parentheses, and the conditional code always follows within curly braces. Some notes about this construct. First of all, the positioning of the curly braces is not super picky. I like I have a certain formatting that I like to use because it, it helps kind of keep me visually honest. So I, I know that for every opening curly brace, I also have a closing curly brace. You do whatever you're comfortable with. Um, in these, these examples, keep in mind that it's not case sensitive. So the if can be uppercase or lowercase. Uh, the hash mark indicates a comment line. PowerShell will, will ignore that. The if part is mandatory. Else if is optional and else is optional. You can have as many else if sections as you want, but only the first matching expression will actually be executed. Let's take a look at a more extensive example. Here's a more complete example. I've supposed that the var variable contains a collection of string objects. If one of those is A, then the first script block will execute. If not, but one of them is B, then the second script block executes. Otherwise, the third script block executes. Remember that anything you do in a script, you can also do at a command line, and that includes these complex constructs. All right, let's look at another decision-making construct called switch. This evaluates a single item, such as a variable, against a range of possible values. Every matching evaluation is executed, so this works a little differently than the, the if construct we already looked at. In this example, I'm switching on the contents of var. If it contains value, then a total of three blocks will execute. The first one, which is a match, the second one, which is a match because of the wildcards, and the third one. When the third block executes, the break keyword will immediately exit the entire switch construct. Now here are some notes about switch. First of all, the values that you're comparing to can contain an asterisk wildcard character for pattern matching. Um, the default block is executed only if no prior condition was matched. And if you only want the first matching condition to execute, use the break keyword in the condition's code block. As soon as the break keyword is encountered, PowerShell will exit the entire switch construct. All right, that's enough decision making. Let's talk about being repetitive with some looping constructs. We'll look at for, do, until, or while, and the while construct. In a for loop, I specify a condition with three elements. First, I create an initial condition by setting i equal to zero. This is very important. Remember that you shouldn't use any variable without first explicitly giving it a value within the current scope. This does so by giving i a value of zero. After a semicolon, I specify the condition that will keep the script executing. Loop so long as i is less than five. After another semicolon, I give an operation which will happen after each loop. Increment i by one. Within the loop, I'm simply displaying the contents of i. 
pause the video and try this out if you like to see how many times the loop executes and what its output is. You should see it count from 0 to 4, at which point i is equal to 5 but not less than 5, so the loop exits. Here's a do while loop. The code inside this loop will always execute at least once. So I start by setting the variable equal to 10 and then immediately decrementing it by 1. I'll loop again while the variable i is greater than 0. Once i actually equals 0, the loop will stop repeating. Now here's almost the reverse of that logic-wise, a do until loop. This loop will always execute at least once because it doesn't decide whether or not to continue until it reaches the end. Inside the loop, I increment i by 1. At the end, I'll loop again until I see that i is greater than 10. Once i equals 11, the loop exits. And finally, a while loop. This loop will only execute if its condition, i being greater than 0, is true to begin with. I've set i equal to 10 to begin with, so it is greater than 0, so the loop will execute at least once. It'll continue executing so long as i is greater than 0. Each time through, I'm decrementing i by 1, so it will eventually exit this loop. And the last thing I've got for you is an enumeration construct called for each. This guy can be confusing, because technically it's an alias to the for each object commandlet. However, when you use this alias in a script, the syntax is different than when you use a commandlet. Otherwise, they work pretty much the same. Just don't think of them as interchangeable. Here's an example of for each. I start by using get WMI object to retrieve a bunch of Win32 process objects and store them in the variable WMI. As I've said before, all WMI calls really return a collection, which means you have to enumerate that collection, and the for each loop is the way to do that. For each dollar sign proc in dollar sign WMI. Now this goes through each object in WMI one at a time. Each time through, the current object will be placed in the variable proc so that I can work with it. I could have used any variable name, but I chose dollar sign proc because it'll contain processes, and the name helps me remember that. Within the loop, I simply use the proc variable to access the current object. There are a couple more elements to the PowerShell scripting language that we won't be covering in this course. The first is trap for error handling, and the second is throw for producing errors. These are covered in the intermediate course. Please pause this video now and follow the instructions in your lab guide to complete this lab. There are hints in the lab guide if you need them. And try to complete the lab without referring to the solution in your lab guide. When you're done, resume this video and I'll review a sample solution with you. In lab 15-1, you were asked to use some of the scripting language constructs to perform a task. Let's see how you did. I started by using read host to get the name of an event log, and stored the event log name in the variable log. I then retrieved the 50 newest events. You might do this for all events if you were doing it for real, but by only getting the newest 50, I can get this to finish a lot faster. I'm storing those events, once I get them, in the events variable. Then I'm running through each of the events in turn using the for each construct. Each time through this loop, the event variable will represent the current event that I'm working with. It's, I'm going to use a switch construct here to look at the current events category property. If it's 0, I set the color variable to green. If it's 101, I set it to yellow, and if it's 103, I set it to red. If it's none of those, I just set it to white. By the way, I picked those category numbers basically at random based on common events on my system. You can change those if you want. After the switch construct, I'm using write host to write the current events time written property to the console in the selected foreground color.